Welcome, listener. This is Sebastian Notwell interviewing R.K. Ashwick. Hello. And Noah Hawthorne. Hello. Today, discussing newsletters. Yay, newsletters. Yes, they are a thing, and we do them. (laughs) Truly, we can confirm newsletters exist. Varying levels of enthusiasm. (laughs) (laughs) Now, both of you have newsletters and release them, yes? Yes. Yes. So what prompted you to create a newsletter? I made my newsletter because Tammy LeBrecht at Newsletter Ninja told me to. <laughs> Before publishing Stray Spirit, I was doing a ton of research into, okay, how do I like actually like pretend to be an author? And one of the elements was the newsletter. And at first, like many people, I was like, I don't need a newsletter. That sounds dumb. And then I was reading resources from Newsletter Ninja and David Gorin, and they were like, you know, you actually probably should do one. And I went, okay, fine. I relate to that so much. Basically, other (laughs) authors that I was following and were doing better than me and that I kind of look up to who now are really successful were like, you know, talking about their newsletters and reader magnets and like, what the heck is a reader magnet? So just a lot of research and feel like I probably will need this. And I feel like maybe in the beginning, it wasn't as engaging as it is now. Like it's definitely better now than it used to be. But I think with a lot of things, you kind of, it's a learning curve. And even if it feels like it's not doing a lot in the beginning, I feel like they really do help. Yeah, you definitely learn a lot as you go, for sure. Why do you think newsletters are important for authors? So one of uh, Newsletter Ninja's main arguments is that if you rely mainly on social media for your reach, you can't really control that platform. And if it ever goes away, if they ever choose to suppress your content, particularly relevant if you write queer fiction, you can't really do anything about that. And you don't want your reach being throttled by a third party with no recourse. And so a newsletter is a good way to be able to directly access your readers without having to rely on that. Yeah, that's a really good point. I feel like that they're helpful too. When it comes to marketing series, that's another good thing about them, especially when you do reader magnets. For me, I do novellas and like, here's a free novella. And usually in the beginning, it was prequel novellas. And now it's like a bonus content kind of for after the end of Sam and Rook. But yeah, it's a way to connect with people that don't have social media, like you said. And I find it's a good way to put more and to also kind of be more personal Mm -hmm. as well. So that's another difference between that and social media. Yeah, absolutely. It's also, like you both said, not subject to anyone else's algorithm. Mm -hmm. Because like, I know on some platforms, your own followers won't see your posts, even though that's why they've signed up to follow you. Yeah, whenever I use TikTok, I never see the people that I follow. Um, Yeah, it's such a, Mm -hmm. what what a mess. And just real quick before we go further, a reader magnet is an extra little bonus thing as kind of a sign-up incentive for readers to sign up to receive your newsletter. Yes. Yes. It is also sometimes called a cookie. Is it really? A cookie. Yeah. Newsletter cookie. I've never heard that. That's awesome. (laughs) That's so fitting because there are several authors I know, particularly in the cozy genre, whose reader magnets are recipes. <laughs> recipes thematic to the characters or their world. But um, yeah, it's like a short story or a deleted scene or some extra background information on the characters or the story or like world building. Just a little something extra that you don't get in the book, but you do get if you sign up for the newsletter. Mm-hmm. Now, what do you two include in your newsletters? I include a bunch of different things. So I will do my own artwork sometimes, and so I include that. I'll generally include writing updates, so I try to not to keep those too, too long. I will include indie author spotlights, uh, book funnel promos, fun facts. And on release days, I will post recipes and photos of the celebratory dessert that I made for the release day. Speaking of recipes. <laughs> what a fun idea. I like that. Yeah, it breaks it up a little bit. Yeah, it makes it more like personal and kind of behind the scenes like. With mine, I do it monthly. It'll include if there's anything releasing or upcoming. I share art to my newsletter first. So any art I've commissioned, the newsletter people see it first. Writing updates. I also have like an indie author area where I share other people's news. When you first sign up is when you get the novellas sent to you. And you also get like this code to the spicy art page. But yeah, like kind of like you said. That's fun. Yeah. So another, that's another little incentive because, you know, and then there's just regular art too. But yeah. You made a really good point about um, making sure the newsletter folks are first to see certain kinds kinds of content because that's another incentive for people to sign up for newsletters. For me, the newsletter folks are usually the first to get cover reveals and like pre-order goodie information. Um, And sometimes they'll also get like behind the scenes stuff that other people like I don't post anywhere at all. Yeah, same here. 
I also do ARC and street team signups there first. I offer it to them first. Mm, that makes sense. Yeah. It's also cool that you both brought up collaborating with other indie authors and including their content in your newsletter. Cause like that, I feel like that helps like both with networking and community building, not just with you and other authors, but also building a larger community of readers, especially like within your specific niche genre. Oh, for sure. Like it's a very direct to inbox version of if you like this, read this. And it also like takes the pressure off of you personally every week or every month or however often you send it to produce produce new content for the newsletter because you can like even if you don't have a book out every month you can say hey while you're waiting for my book here's something cool that someone else is doing in a similar vein yep exactly and i think when one of us like when we help each other out we all do better and with anything i feel like it's community over competition but especially with indie publishing and indie authors indie artists all of them absolutely it's also like, I think the the type of reader who signs up for a newsletter is also the type of reader who's always looking for something new to read, or at least something to like add to the TBR. And so I think it's really nice that you can kind of like curate your like, hey, you want to read this one next? I don't know. I, I think it's really fun. It's one of my favorite parts of the newsletters when I have that spot available. Absolutely. In your experience, what do readers expect from a newsletter? I mean, I... <laughs> since I, I guess I'm a reader, but I'm not a reader, if that makes sense. I don't know if I can speak for all the readers, but I know Tammy and the Newsletter Ninja post has, has talked a lot about readers wanting to see you as a person. And Noah's touched on this too, but they want stories. They want personality. They don't want marketing spiels or constant selling. And so, yeah, I think it is a good way to reach out to a reader personally and just let them get to know you, maybe without with the lens of like having to be super polished on social media, if that makes sense. Yeah, I think, too, we're bombarded with so many emails these days. Like, it seems like everything is like, sign up for this, sign up for that. And when someone chooses to sign up for your newsletter, I feel like that's a really good feeling. And I think they're doing that because, like you say, they want more than just marketing. They want to know more about you or how you write or, you know, the behind the scenes stuff and the personal stuff. And they want to see the author, which is what you said. But yeah, they want fun stuff. Pretty cool, I think. It's like, oh, you, you, you want my newsletter? <laughs> Yeah, they want a fun email rather than boring emails. What mistakes should authors avoid in their newsletters? Speaking of the hard sell. Yeah, um, I would definitely avoid constantly selling your product because, you know, that's not why they signed up. They don't want another like spam email. I would also avoid being overly negative consistently. You know, obviously they like if something really bad happened to you, if you want to rant about it, like that's cool. But you also don't want them to associate your name popping up in their inbox with negativity, if that makes sense. And then one thing that I saw, I signed up for a newsletter where it was extremely light colored font against a white background. Oh. And it was just physically hard to read. And so I would just recommend like doing a pass and just making sure it's like legible. That's something that I'm like, oh, I... <laughs> That's really, really important, guys. Yeah. Yeah. I also, I wouldn't add too many links. That's something that I learned later. Because generally, if it's like the third or more link in the email, it's probably not going to get clicked on. So it's kind of like the dead zone. And if you have a ton of links in there, your email is more likely to be marked as spam. And so that can impact your like sendability. And so I would avoid that. So like I used to have like all of my social media links at the bottom. Those are kind of like hidden links that kind of gum up the works a little bit in the back end. And so I ended up taking those out. That's a really good point. Yeah, it's interesting you bring up social media links because like in a way, like you said, when it's already making your newsletter more difficult to reach your readers and like if they sign up for your newsletter, they're either already following you on social media probably or looking for an alternative to social media or something that is, like we said, more personal and more exclusive than social media so it's a little redundant kind of yeah i would agree i know some authors that like link to each book and every email like here are my books but what i do is i just at the top where there's like the logo i have website and bookstore underneath it and that's it they want to find me they find it stuff through either of those and then the only links i put in is if like here's the pre-order or the links to the indie authors that i attach or whatever yeah generally the one with the most links is like the welcome email and that's you know got the book funnel links and that one does kind of introduce the first books in the series another thing too with links is in a welcome email one that's scheduled or something like that check them because, you know, sometimes they get updated, you change things, or like in my case, I changed the name of my link tree, so it was going to a bad place that wasn't there anymore, you know what I mean? So check your links and update them periodically, and I would say do that for like your website and other things too. 
it's just one of those things that gets kind of forgotten about. Yeah, completely agree. Yeah, I think that's really the only thing I can think of for something that I would do again. You know, I did change providers or whatever halfway through, and I do like the new one now, so I wouldn't be afraid to kind of explore a little bit. Don't feel like you have to be stuck with anybody. No, out of curiosity, which provider do you use? I use MailerLite. Yeah, same. Yeah, I just use the free version of that, and then I have my email. I use WordPress. I got a domain and email through them. So it's like Noah Hawthorne at National Publishing. Or I was just sending from Gmail. You know, it wasn't like a professional, professional one. But now I have one that's like from an actual domain, which I don't feel like is necessarily required. But if you can, it helps from getting your newsletter emails bounced or sent to spam. Like it makes you more official in the eyes of the email security. Yeah, I know a bunch of us were actually going through domain authentication woes um, a couple weeks ago. Yeah. Or maybe a couple months ago at this point. Yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, I would recommend doing that just as a part of your initial setup so you don't have to worry about it later. And MailerLite in particular has some fairly exhaustive tutorials in how to authenticate your domain through them. Yeah. To kind of get that issue sorted. Yeah, it took me a minute, but it wasn't my fault. The, the instruction <laughs> or was my fault, not the instructions fault. Right. Part of the problem for me was just like, because of the way the information refreshes on the respective websites, you have to wait 24 hours between each attempt to authenticate. And like, that drags out the troubleshooting process so far. <laughs> It really does. Yeah. Ugh. I'm glad that's behind me. Yeah, same. Knock on wood. <laughs> what is one thing you wished you'd known before you started your newsletter? I wish I had researched more about welcome automations. Noah kind of touched on it a little bit, but welcome automations, it's a series of emails you can have auto send once a person signs up for your newsletter. It gradually kind of introduces them to the newsletter, tells them what to expect. It sends them the reader magnet or the cookie. For me, I've only got like two emails in that sequence. So once you sign up, you get the reader magnet, which for me is bonus scenes from both Stray Spirit and Rivalmost File. And then you'll get an email a couple days later just confirming, hey, did you get the reader magnet um, and giving a little bit of information about me? And then a final one talking a little bit about my books. And then after that, you're kind of dropped into the main group and then you, you get the normal newsletter. But I feel like, um, I don't know, I wish I had just researched that a little bit more before setting that up because I think I had to go through a couple iterations to get like a workflow that I was kind of happy with. And even then, you know, like I'm sure there's a ton of things I can improve with that workflow. And like Noah said, I need to check it regularly. Like when I release a new book, I need to make sure that that last email actually mentions it um, and stuff like that. I don't think I knew about book funnel when I first started. Using book funnel to deliver things is really helpful and being able to link that. I can't remember how I did it before. I think it was like download this document or something like that. You know, it wasn't a very efficient way to do it. So book funnel is good. But basically just what we touched on before, just I think I felt like it had to be more markety and professional in the beginning. And then as I started doing it and realizing what expectations were and people were, I allowed myself to be that more authentic behind the scenes person. So just kind of finding your groove is what I struggled with at first. Yeah. I should claim that I am not a sponsor for Book Funnel or MailerLite or Tammy or David. <laughs> <laughs> I just really like them. Yeah, Book Funnel is a great free resource for you to be able to send people like eARCs, reader magnets, you know, anything like that. And if somebody like has it like a technical issue downloading, they don't go to you, they go to Book Funnel. Yeah. Which is really <laughs> very nice. <laughs> um, saves my sanity. But I would recommend going through Newsletter Ninja. So that's Tammy Labreck and then David Gurin, G-A-U-G-H-R-A-N. Because David specifically has like this whole video about how he really messed up his newsletter like years and years ago and like really had to build from scratch. And he explains like what he did wrong, how he rebuilt it. And I found that super, super valuable. And they also, they do go through a little bit of like the technical process of setting it up, which for me, I think was the most intimidating part. And so I do recommend, and they've got both, they both have free resources on newsletters too. So highly recommend looking at them if you're interested in setting up a newsletter, but you don't know where to start. I am excited to check that out. That sounds perfect. Yeah, they're awesome. Sebastian, do you have a newsletter? Not yet. <laughs> <laughs> Well, now's the perfect time to set one up. I would follow your newsletter, Sebastian. What? I would sign up. I'm still working on getting the reader magnets together because oh, instead fair. of writing a series like, you know, a smart person, I wrote instead like five completely separate books. <laughs> I mean, that's a whole like separate topic for a different podcast, but... <laughs> 
I find series really difficult. And so in a separate podcast topic, I would love to dig more into like series versus standalones, but completely valid. Yeah. Reader magnets, like it's a whole separate task on top of your normal writing. And so, yeah, it does take a while to spin up. Yeah. Then once it's done, you can just automatically send it. You know, it's just the one time and then once once in a while, maybe add some new ones on when you can. But yeah. Once I finish writing five separate short stories. (laughs) Oh my God. (laughs) <laughs> oh man it'll be fine it'll be fine it's gonna tell it up to like a whole book in itself yeah oh lord <laughs> do you see why i do not yet have a newsletter <laughs> i see i see it oh gracious it's fine i'm here as the illustrative don't do this kids example for newsletters <laughs> <laughs> no it's okay It's never too late to set up a newsletter. Someday. Soon, ideally. Someday. Maybe by the time this podcast comes out, who knows? (laughs) (laughs) One other thing that I did think of in terms of things that I wish I had known, and of course, I know like Tammy and David have spoken about this and I just ignored it, but inviting people to interact with the newsletter so they understand that it's not just like a no reply email and that there is a person behind it. I think the first time I finally like asked like a question, someone was like, oh, I didn't know I could reply to this email. And I was like, yeah, I'm right here, guys. <laughs> Not only does it help with sendability, but it's also just fun to get stuff back. I don't think that's something you need to put necessarily in every newsletter, but uh, that was something that I had wish I had kind of added as a part of the newsletter rhythm. Um, and I keep forgetting about it. <laughs> so uh, I will improve one day. Today I learned you can reply to author newsletters. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, they're they're really they're not no reply uh, emails. It just goes to my inbox. Oh, that's very cool. I never really thought about that either. Yeah, if um and on like the more technical side, if somebody replies to your email, it kind of like auto whitelists your email for them. Oh. Um, and so it's less likely that your email is going to hit spam for them. And the less you're hitting spam in individual people's inboxes, the more your newsletter might actually get sent out. That is extremely cool and something I will absolutely be employing as soon as I get myself together and get a newsletter out there. <laughs> my welcome sequence does ask people what their favorite um, D&D class is. And I do always reply to people who respond back with their favorite D&D class because I have strong feelings about the sorcerer class and I like talking <laughs> about it with people. Hell yeah. <laughs> That's a really good idea. I'm totally doing this now. Yeah, it's fun. So where can readers sign up for your newsletters? Oh, <laughs> yeah, I guess I should have anticipated this question. <laughs> You can you can sign up on my website, so rkashwick.com, and all my social media should have a link tree to the sign up page. Uh, if you sign up, you will get bonus scenes for both Stray Spirit and Rivalmos File. And, and then I usually send uh, emails once a month. You can find the sign up for mine in my link tree and on my website. My website is Neshama Publishing, that's N-E-F-H-A-M-A publishing.com. For mine, you get novellas, art, IC art, and behind-the-scenes stuff. Fantastic. Well, thank you both for coming on the podcast today and excited to have you back in the future soon. Thank you. Good time. Thank you.